I would invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings chapter 3 this morning. 1 Kings chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at uh, the story of Solomon today. As we are continuing uh, looking at different characters of the Bible, thinking about our theme, pressing on, and, and noticing how that so many times these, these people that we associate with, uh, you know, really giants of the faith and these famous people of the Bible, that so often we think of just the highlights of their, their stories and we, we don't really pause to consider the struggles they had. And we're just going to look at one, one message on the story of Solomon. We could, we could definitely uh, make a month of Sundays in studying his life, but we're just going to take this one, uh, one message this morning and consider uh, an aspect that he's probably most famous for, and that is the wisdom of Solomon. I want to begin reading 1 Kings chapter 3, verse number 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, And I am but a child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And and God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, but hast asked, nor hast asked the life of thy enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any rise arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream, and He came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all His servants. I want to preach a message today entitled, Walking in Wisdom. Walking in Wisdom. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before You this morning, we again ask for Your help as we approach Your Word because... Without the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, we are completely helpless. Lord, we need you to impress upon us the truth of your word, and today specifically, just how badly we need your wisdom every single day. Lord, help us to walk in wisdom, and in so doing, to avoid the mistakes that would ruin our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been doing something or maybe we were given a job or something like that and and you you got into the middle of it and very quickly you realized, I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) You ever been in a situation like that before? Maybe you entered into it thinking, all right, I can, I can do this. I, I, I think I can figure this out. And, and all of a sudden it's like, nope, I'm way in, I'm in way over my head here. Well, if you've ever been in a situation like that, you can then begin to identify with where Solomon is here in 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon is one of David's son. And he's the son that God said was to be David's successor. He was going to take over as king once David's reign was ended. 
And we, we could take a lot of time to look at the, kind of the backstory there. It's amazing to me that Solomon was David's son and Bathsheba's. You know, David, King David had five wives that are listed in Scripture. Um, why is it that God chose the son of David and Bathsheba versus other sons who were older than Solomon? But God chose Solomon to be David's successor. And here is Solomon. He has now become the king. And on this particular night, he has a dream. And in the dream, God asks him to ask of the Lord anything that he wanted. Here was Solomon trying to follow in the footsteps of the greatest king of Israel's history. Several million people that he was supposed to lead, not only politically, but spiritually, and he had no idea what he was doing. And if he was going to lead the nation of Israel well, he was going to need some help. And on this night, the Lord appeared to him and, and told him to ask for anything he wanted. And Think about that. This is kind of like Aladdin's lamp. You know that, that myth, right? Aladdin finds the lamp and he rubs the lamp and, and out jumps a genie and and uh, grants three wishes, any three things that uh, he wanted he could have. Well, this is not quite the same because this was a real situation. The Lord said to Solomon, ask what you want. I wonder what would you ask for if you were in this situation? If God came to you today and said, ask me whatever you want, and you had a 100% guarantee that you would get that thing right now, what would you ask for? Maybe some people would ask uh, for... Ten million dollars. Maybe some people would ask for, for healing for themselves or for someone else. What would you ask for? Well, when the Lord gave Solomon the opportunity to ask for anything that he wanted, Solomon just asked God for one thing. He didn't ask for wealth. He didn't ask for honor. He didn't ask for victory over his enemies on the battlefield. He asked God for wisdom and understanding. There are going to be many times in our journey that we're faced with situations and confronted with our own ignorance. And as we think about pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, we cannot overlook our need for wisdom as we go along life's path. We realize many times that we have no idea what we're doing. And we need God's wisdom at those times. But what is even more dangerous, though, is when we race through life thinking that we have everything figured out and we make our decisions based on foolish, fleshly impulses instead of relying on the wisdom of God. We must understand that we need God's wisdom to make the right choices as we walk through life. And thankfully, we've been given the promise of God that if we ask for that wisdom, He will give it to us. You may be familiar with James chapter 1 and verse number 5, which says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. What I'd like to do this morning is, is take that verse from the New Testament and kind of overlay it on the story of Solomon. And we're going to notice some things that Solomon's story illustrates about that truth in James, James 1.5. First of all, we're going to see that you have to acknowledge your need for wisdom. If you don't think you need wisdom, you won't get it. <laughs> Number two, you need to ask God for it. God commands us to do that. He doesn't say, I will just give it to you regardless of whether you want it or not. He says, you have to petition me for it. But then number three, we're going to see that you have to act on that wisdom that God gives. Because it's one thing to know what is right, and it's a completely different thing to actually do it. Let's notice this from Solomon's story. First of all, you have to acknowledge your need for wisdom. And the dream that Solomon had, 
God came to him and, and gave him blase, basically a blank check. He said, ask for me what you want. And in verse number 7, notice Solomon's words again. He said, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Now Solomon was not a kid at this point. He was an adult. He was not a little child literally. But he's speaking of himself as far as his understanding goes. He says, I... Basically, I feel like a little kid. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I love how he says, I don't even know how to come out and go in. You know, one of the things that little children try to figure out almost immediately after learning to walk is how to open doors. You know, it begins with the kitchen cabinets. <laughs> they get in there and, and, and what do they want to do? They want to open up those cabinets. Right? That's why you have to have those little security locks on there so they don't... You know, get in there and hurt themselves or get in there and hide and you don't know where they are for three hours or something like that. And, and so they figure out the kitchen cabinets and then they want to learn how to use the, 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 the doors to the bedrooms and the bathrooms. And just as soon as they're able to reach it, you know, they're trying to figure that thing out, this very complicated mechanism. How does this magic work, you know? They want to know how to go in and come out. And Solomon says, I'm like a little kid. I don't even know how to open and close doors. And what he's saying here is, that it, is it, he's acknowledging his need for wisdom. So many people live in foolishness because they never reach this very first step. They think they are wise, and so they never ask for wisdom. If you're going to have God's wisdom for life, you have to first of all acknowledge your need for it. Now Solomon was not an ignorant fellow. Think about it. He was a prince. He would have grown up with the best education in the land. We can already see in the first couple chapters of 1 Kings how that he was actually a pretty competent fellow. You can go back and read in these chapters and some of the things he said and did. I mean, he, he understood a lot. I mean, he was not dumb, okay? It's not like he had not had any education or experience and no measure of, of competence or intelligence, but he knew that his understanding was limited. It was not enough. And see, in our pride, we think that our education and our experience that we've already had is enough. We think, okay, I can, I can do this. I can handle this. I know what the right direction is here because... I've got it figured out. In our pride, we think this way. Solomon understood that he needed a greater source of wisdom than himself. Now, when we consider the situation he was in, I mean, here he was taking over the kingdom from King David, his, his father, and he's going to be in charge of uh, uh, millions of people. And I mean, this was a big burden, a big responsibility. And you think, well, yeah, I mean, you need wisdom of God for that. But, you know, there's a lot of things in life. This is the way we think sometimes. There's a lot of things in life that I can handle. I got it. You know, I'll go to God for the big stuff. But I don't want to bother Him with the little things. Can I tell you that there is nothing so small in life that you don't need God's wisdom for it? You need God's wisdom for everything. And let me tell you this, God cares about all the little things too. You're not bothering God when you come before Him with a need for wisdom. It's amazing how God does things because I had a great illustration of this happen to me just a couple of hours ago this morning. Here's what happened. I, I lost my checkbook. I couldn't find it anywhere. Now, I don't use the checkbook very often, but I do use it on occasion. And, and the, when I couldn't find it, I went to the normal places I would put it, I, I began to get a little agitated. Where is it? Now it became, I need it to, I'm going to be going crazy until I find it. You've been there, right? You know, you just, you got to find this thing because it's going to drive you nuts. I looked everywhere. I, I looked in my bag. I looked in the cars. I looked through the pockets of all of my coat, suit coats. I mean, I, was, I couldn't find this thing anywhere. And I was walking through the front hall here and I just said, you know, Lord, I really need to find that checkbook. 
And I'm preaching on wisdom this morning and how that, you know, you need God's wisdom for everything. Lord, would you help me find the checkbook? Would you give me the wisdom to find the checkbook? And I prayed that. I did, sincerely. Because I wanted to find the checkbook. <laughs> and I thought this would be a cool illustration. <laughs> sure enough, about ten minutes later, I'm in my office again. I've already dug through all the drawers, my file basket. I mean, I've been through everything. And I'm like, wait a second. I have a, one, a, an accordion folder that I keep important documents in. Maybe I threw it in there. So I pulled it out of the drawer, opened it up. Sure enough, there it was right there. I found my checkbook. And I believe firmly that that was a direct answer to prayer. So next time you lose your keys or your glasses or your wallet, stop and say, Lord, I need some help here. There's nothing too little for you to depend on God's wisdom for. You need God's wisdom for everything. But let me also say that there's nothing too big that God can't give you the wisdom for. You know, sometimes we just, we are faced with huge decisions or huge problems and we're like, there's no way I, 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 I'm, there's no way I can figure this out. You can't, but God can. And the first step in getting God's wisdom is to acknowledge your lack. How many of us lack wisdom? The truth is, all of us to some degree. When we compare our wisdom to the eternal standard of God's, what does Romans 8 verse 33 say, or 11 verse 33 rather, says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. You might think you're smart when you compare yourselves to others. But you start comparing yourself to God and you'll realize very quickly just how ignorant you really are. At the end of the book of Job, the, first, the, the whole middle section of Job, from about chapter 3 to about chapter 38 or so, is a story of Job and his friends arguing. Trying to figure out why all this bad stuff happened to Job. And as you read through there, you, you, if you read Job's words in particular, you, you kind of can feel the building sense of frustration in Job because he couldn't figure out what had caused all these problems. His friends are telling him, Job, there must be something wrong in your life. Because bad things only happen to bad people, right? That was their philosophy. And Job's saying, I don't know of anything. I don't know why this would have happened. I, I, don't, I haven't done anything that I know of. And at and several points he addresses God and says, God, answer me, tell me. That's in essence is what he's saying. And then, then finally God shows up and he speaks to Job. And God says to Job, Job, stand up, act like a man. Let me ask you a few questions. Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you, Job? Where were you when I created everything that is? And, and God goes through several chapters just laying out all different kinds of examples from creation to drive home this one point to Job. Job, I'm smarter than you are. And I don't answer to you. And as far as we know, Job never got a direct answer for God of why his story happened like it did. God never answers him directly in the text of Scripture. But Job, after God asked him all these questions, he, he came to realize, boy, I'm dumb. <laughs> My word's not his. But that's the essence of what he says. I've uttered things that were too high for me, things which I understood not. And that's the point we have to get to when we realize, I don't know. I need wisdom from God. I believe a lot of the trials that we go through are designed by God to remind us of the limits of our own wisdom and to teach us to trust Him more. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy path. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, Solomon said, I'm just a kid, I'm just a child. I don't know how to go in or come out. First of all, 
You must acknowledge your need of wisdom. But then secondly, you need to ask God for wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And in our text here, 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 9, here was Solomon's specific request. Having acknowledged his lack of wisdom, he uses this unique opportunity that God has given him to ask for wisdom. He says, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? He knew that he needed something, and so he asked for it. It reminds us of our necessity of offering up a prayer for wisdom if we expect to receive wisdom from God. And when you really understand just how much you lack wisdom and just how infinite God's supply is, then it only makes sense that you come to God and say, Lord, I need some. I need some wisdom now. We must ask God for wisdom in order for this promise to be fulfilled. The book of James will later go on to say in chapter 4, verse number 2, Ye have not because ye ask not. You know, many times we make foolish decisions that could have been avoided simply because we didn't ask God for wisdom. We didn't ask God for guidance. We were, uh, we were confronted with a situation or we were given a, a decision that we had to make and we just said, okay, I got this one, go this way. And we didn't even stop to ask God and because of that we made a mistake. We made a mess of things. Maybe we had to go back and fix it. When all of that could have been avoided if we'd have just said, Lord, what would you have me to do here? Lord, I need some wisdom. Give me some guidance here. Show me what I need to do. Just simply ask. Matthew 7 and verse number 7. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Do we really avail ourselves of the privilege of prayer as we should? So many times in Scripture, God invites us to ask, to come before Him with our requests, to come boldly under the throne of grace. Do we really avail ourselves of that? Sometimes it's our pride that stops us in saying, from asking God. Or maybe in some strange way that we, we are worried that that God will be upset if we come to Him again and ask. But you know what James 1.5 says? That God giveth liberally and upbraideth not. Isn't that a wonderful promise? God says, if you need wisdom, come to me. Just ask. I'm not going to scold you for it. I'm not going to chew you out. I'm not going to punish you. Just because you came to me asking for wisdom... As a child of God, God delights in answering your prayers. He's happy when you come to Him with your needs. You don't have to worry that you're bothering God. God wants you to come to Him. He giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Aren't you glad that God is generous? He's generous. And not just with the wisdom that He dispenses to His children. He's generous in every way. And the greatest example of that generosity, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You may, you may wonder, will God give me wisdom if I come to Him? All you have to do is look at the cross for proof that yes, God will give it. Because... Romans 8.32 says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Just look at the cross. If God was willing to give his own son so that you and I could be saved from our sins, do you think that he's going to be stingy on all the lesser stuff? Do you think God would be like, all right, I'll give my son, but nothing else? No, that was the greatest thing he could ever give. And with Jesus, it says, he has freely given us all things. 
See, God delights in hearing and answering our prayer. You and I, we get tired of people asking us the same question over and over again. Right? Somebody comes to you repeatedly with the same question. It's like, I've already dealt with this umpteen times before. God's not like that when we come to Him with our needs. It's not like God's going to be like, oh, you need wisdom again? Didn't I just give you wisdom yesterday? No, God's not going to do that. He never tires of hearing us request what we need from Him. He wants us to depend on Him for all things at all times. So if we want wisdom, God says just ask. And that's what Solomon did. He said, Lord, give me understanding that I might discern between good and bad. And notice what the Lord did and back in 1 Kings 3 verse 10, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said to him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Isn't it interesting that when God answers Solomon in this dream, He answers in the past tense. He doesn't say, I will give thee. He said, I have given thee. It's done. When Solomon asked, it was fulfilled. And it pleased the Lord, it says in verse number 10. It made God happy when Solomon recognized his need of wisdom and asked God for it. So God gave it to him along with many other things. God said, in addition to that, I'm going to add to you honor and riches and victory over your enemies and all of these other things. So God answered, God gave it to him. And James 1.5 says, and it shall be given him. Ask of God which giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. When you ask for wisdom, God will give it. It's not a matter of, you know, kind of waiting up in the air, all right, I've asked, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. No, God will give you wisdom. But you must act on that wisdom. That's number three. Act on the wisdom of God. When you acknowledge your need and you ask, God will give the wisdom. Now it's up to you. All right. What do I do with this? Do I act on this wisdom or not? You see, the, the struggle's not over once God's given the wisdom because you and I still have this sinful flesh. And even though we might know what is the right thing to do, our flesh is going to say, oh, I don't want to do that. Let's do something different. And we have to make a choice to act on the wisdom of God. To actually do what God says and what God leads us to do. And actually not do what God says not to do. And not go where God is not leading us. We have to act on the wisdom of God. What does that look like in practice? Well, we find a great illustration of it in 1 Kings chapter 3. Verse 16, it says, There came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the woman said, O my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after I was delivered that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And... This woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it and she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. 
Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king, and the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son, and said, O oh my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. And the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. You know, this story has become the most famous example of wisdom in history. People who don't even really know the Bible, they've probably heard this story used as an example of, you know, being smart. It's, it's, it's so common that we take it for granted, but put yourself back in the situation as it was happening. Here's Solomon shortly after this dream that he has, and, and God has given him wisdom, and these two women come in. The one has a grievance because her child died, and the other woman switched babies, or, or rather, she switched babies with the other, other woman, and, and now the the, the mother comes in and she says, the living baby is mine. And the other lady says, no, it's mine. And there's this, how would you solve that problem? They didn't have DNA tests. And Solomon, I mean, he does something shockingly cruel. He makes a suggestion that's horrifying. He says, bring me a sword. Let's just cut the baby in half and give half to each. What? That's horrible. Solomon, why would you even suggest such a thing? Because God had given him the wisdom to know that by suggesting something so horrific, the true mother would speak out in defense of the child and say, no, 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 no. don't kill my baby. Let her, let her keep my baby if it means the baby can live. And that's exactly what happened, and Solomon knew who the real mother was. And this story has become such a famous example of wisdom. How did it happen? It happened because Solomon, first of all, acknowledged his need of wisdom. He asked for it, and then he put it into action and actually applied God's wisdom. To life. We all need wisdom. I think it's something we should pray for on a daily basis, especially considering that God has promised to give it. Now, verse 6 of James 1 goes on to say, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. There is that important stipulation that we must believe God, believe that He will keep His promise to give us wisdom. But when we ask in faith, God will give us wisdom as we need it. How does God give us wisdom? I want to close by thinking about and answering that question for a moment. How does God give us wisdom? Is this just like, you know, he zaps us in the head with a lightning bolt and all of a sudden we're the smartest person on the planet? I mean, how does this work? Well, there are several ways that God gives us wisdom. And I want to mention a few of them to you for your consideration. How does God give us wisdom? How does he answer our prayer and fulfill his promise here? Well, first and foremost, the first way that God gives wisdom is through God's Word through the Bible. Okay, it is hypocritical for you to say, I need wisdom from God. God, give me wisdom, and then leave your Bible to collect dust throughout the week. That's hypocritical. This is God's written revelation to you and to me. God revealing Himself to us, revealing ourselves to ourselves. 
and showing us how to live our lives. If we want wisdom, then we need to get in this book and we need to read it. We need to take it to heart. We need to study it. We need to know what it says. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. This will show you where to go. But that means you have to be in it. In Scripture, we find so many clear commands that if we take them and we apply them to life, will prevent us from making mistakes. If God says do something, do it. That's wisdom. If God says don't do something, don't do it. Because in not doing it, you're displaying wisdom. Follow the Word of God. So many people take a mystical approach to God's wisdom. That, you know, if they pray for wisdom, well, then they're going to get this tingly feeling or something that, you know, well, this is the right way. Be careful of your feelings. Your feelings are the absolute worst guide for life. It's Hollywood nonsense. Follow your heart. Follow your feelings. If you want to ruin your life, that's the best way to do it. Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. No. Don't go with your feelings. Start with the Word of God. What does God say? If God says do it, do it. That's wisdom. God says don't do it. Don't do it. That's wisdom. So that's where you have to start. The primary way that God gives wisdom is through His Word. And there are many times that you will find principles in Scripture. Not a clear command necessarily because it's, it's a principle that is designed to be universal and to apply to many different situations. Taking those principles to heart and when you're faced with a situation saying, you know what, uh, God doesn't specifically say thou shalt buy this car and thou shalt not buy that car. But you know, here's some principles that I can apply to this situation. And many other examples we can give, but take the word of God to heart. Very quickly, another way that God can give, specific, give wisdom is by specific answers to prayer. Specific answers to prayer. And I'm careful how I say this. If you need to know what God wants you to do, I would encourage you to start praying specifically for God to guide you. And praying specific prayers in that process. Lord, if you want me to do this, then open this door. Lord, would you do this for me? Guide me through this process. You know, I, as a pastor, I've heard it said on occasion, people are making a major life decision. And as a pastor, I've looked at the situation and I said, this seems like a mistake to me for a lot of biblical reasons. And, I, and I've discussed it with the person and they will inevitably say to me, well, I've prayed about it. I've prayed about it. You know, for a while, a long time, really, years, I, I didn't know how to... How do you respond to that, you know? Somebody says, well, I prayed about it. I mean, that's like the ultimate defense for whatever I want to do. I can just say, I prayed about it, and therefore you can't tell me I can't do it. And then one time I was, I was reading something, and I don't even remember who, who the author was, but he pointed something out, a response to that kind of a question, and I, I plan to use it for the rest of my life. He, he said, basically, when somebody tells me they prayed about something, I ask them, this question, what specific answers to prayer did you receive in return? I was like, ooh, that's a good question. Because a lot of times people say, well, I prayed about it. And, you know, God didn't strike me dead, and, and, and I, and I kind of feel good about it, so I'm going to do it. And really all it is is, is their flesh has so consumed them in this instance that they're going to do it one way or the other kind of idea. So you ask them, all right, you've prayed about it. What specific answers to prayer did you see? Ooh. What door did you see God open or close? What circumstance did you see God supernaturally alter? Tell me, what answer to prayer did you see? That's a good question. Pray specifically. You know, people get theological heartburn over the story of Gideon. And his fleece, you know. Gideon, God came to him and appeared to him and said, All right, Gideon, I want you to lead my army while he was hiding in the barn. 
basically. And it's important to note that Gideon did not know he was talking to the Lord initially. But one of the things that Gideon did to be sure that this was indeed the Lord talking to him is he prayed, Lord, I'm going to put out this fleece. And if, if it's really you and you really want me to do this, then I, I want the fleece to be wet and the ground around it to be dry tomorrow. And sure enough, God answered that prayer. And then the next night, Gideon's like, all right, Lord, I, I know what you did, but can you just give me some assurance here and let's reverse it? And God did it. And so some people say it's wrong to put out a fleece because you're tempting God. Other people say, no, you need to put out a fleece in every instance so you know for sure what God want, wants to do. My takeaway from the story is this. God knows how to guide His children into His specific will. And God will not let you miss that will if you're honestly seeking it. Now, your fleece or not, you know, may look completely different, but I would encourage you to pray specific prayers for God's guidance. I've got to move quickly here. A few other ways that the Lord gives wisdom. Number three, the peace of God. Now, I've, I've tried to put these kind of in order of importance. And we have to be careful about this peace of God thing because our flesh is so tricky. Sometimes we get it confused one way or the other. Sometimes, you know, our flesh is like, oh, no, this is great. And we say, well, that must be the peace of God. Well, maybe it's not. Or our flesh says, I don't want to do that, but really God wants us to. So we have to be careful. But Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body and be you thankful. Let the peace of God rule. The idea there is be the referee. When going through life and you're faced with a decision, and this is especially true as you've matured in Christ, God will give you the peace that you need, that a decision or direction is the right one. In the same token, He will withhold that peace when a direction's not. I'm, I'm thankful for the example of my father in this. He was, a, he was a man who never made a hasty decision. And there were many times that I remember for years my dad was frustrated with his, his work situation. And he had opportunities to go work at other cabinet shops. And in fact, my dad could have run his own cabinet shop and done phenomenal with it. And, and for years, he dealt with things that were just, just nonsense. He didn't have to deal with it. And, and, I, and especially in my teenage years, I'm wondering, Dad, why do you put up with this? Why don't you just change jobs? Why don't you go here? Why don't you do that? And it all boiled down to this one thing. He didn't have peace about it. I can't tell you how many times I heard my dad say that. I don't have peace about it. And he would not pursue a course unless he knew for sure that that's what the Lord wanted him to do. I'm thankful for that example. And I know there have been so many times in my life where I was considering doing something and I just didn't have peace about it. You know, you, you just can't put your finger on it sometimes. You can't say, well, because of this, I don't want to do it. But there's just this... This uneasiness about you. Listen, that, don't ignore that. If you don't have the peace of God, don't pursue. On the other hand, maybe you're considering something and it, it's going to be a hard situation, a difficult path to go down, but in your heart, you know this is the right one. It works both ways. So the peace of God. Number four, how does God give wisdom? Through the advice and the instructions of others. Yes. Especially those who are in authority over you in some way. Their advice and instruction goes a long way in showing you what God wants you to do and what, what He doesn't want you to do. You need to have a multitude of godly counselors who will help you. Proverbs 15.22 Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. On this point, be careful of advice shopping. Some people make up their mind they're going to do something, and then they go shopping for people who will affirm that, you know. Well, I know this person will probably agree with me, so I'm going to talk to them. That person probably won't agree with me, I'm not going to talk to them. 
Be careful of advice shopping. I purposely, when I'm, when I'm considering big decisions, I, I have purposely asked people who I knew would give a different answer. I'll ask one person who I'm pretty sure they're going to say yes, and, I'm pretty, and I'll ask this other person who I'm pretty sure is going to say no, and I'll ask them both. Why? Because I want to make sure that I'm getting all of the angles on this situation. I want to hear all the opinions. I want to make sure I'm not missing something. Is that frustrating sometimes? Yeah. You know, you ask a bunch of people and it's like 50-50 split, you know. But the benefit of it is that you know you have considered this from multiple angles. So be careful of advice shopping. Listen to instructions, especially of your authorities. Young people, God has given you parents for a reason. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, people in church. But starting with parents. I don't know if you know this or not, but they did a poll several years ago, and they found out that in 100% of cases, parents were older than their children. Isn't that amazing? So by extension then, we can conclude they have more life experience. And, and they may not have the level of education that you as a seventh grader do, but they've got a whole lot more time in the school of hard knocks. And God has given you parents as that first line of defense for making bad choices. Listen to their advice and follow their instructions. Now, there will come a time where you grow up and you move out maybe and or you get to a point in your life where you're no longer technically under the direct rule of your parents, you should still seek their wisdom and counsel. And all of this really can be summarized like this. God gives wisdom through the leading of the Holy Spirit. He gives wisdom through the leading of the Holy Spirit. That leading can look differently but it ultimately goes back to God guiding us through the Holy Spirit. It was Solomon who penned these words in Proverbs chapter 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He's a buckler to them that walk uprightly. That's what God will do. We see that in the story of Solomon. But sadly, Solomon's story does not end there. His story becomes a warning to us later on of what happens when we fail to act upon the wisdom of God. You know, Solomon started out his career building a temple for Jehovah God. But he ended it building temples for heathen idols. How did that happen? Well, he made a series of fatal mistakes involving women. 1 Kings 11 says, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn your hearts after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. You know what Solomon failed to do in this situation? He failed to apply that very first source of wisdom, the Word of God. God in the law had said, don't marry 
heathen women. They will turn you away from me. They will turn you to false gods. He failed to act upon that. I'm sure there was a big element of sensual lust involved in these decisions. There was also a big element of political advantage. But Solomon discarded the instructions of the Word of God and said, I'm going to do something different. And it was his demise. Verse 4 of 1 Kings 11, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Don't take God's wisdom for granted. Don't think, well, I'm on, a, I'm on the right path today, so I'm good forever. No, you have to choose day by day. You have to choose moment by moment to seek God's wisdom and to apply it to your life. We need wisdom from God. Act on God's wisdom. Ask for God's wisdom because you acknowledge your need for wisdom. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the promises of your word, the instructions and examples that we find in it. And as we've considered the story of Solomon today, we're reminded how, how much we need wisdom as we go through the journey of life. The decisions that are made day by day, affect the outcome and direction of our lives. Lord, we need you to show us what is the right path, and to strengthen us to make the right choices. Lord, I pray that right now in the hearts of your people, you would impress upon them their own ignorance so they might turn more fully to you to rely on for you uh, for wisdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I would like for Dr. Alman to play number 456. I need thee every hour. As we think about just how little we know of life. How often we're faced with situations that we don't have the answer for. May we be reminded this morning how much we need Him. But also how He has promised to give us that wisdom if we ask. As He begins to play, I, would you just go to God in prayer right now? Right now just go to God and say, Lord, I don't have all the answers. There's a lot of things I don't know. There's a lot of things I don't know I don't know. And Lord, I need wisdom. Ask God right now. Say, Lord, give me the wisdom I need to make the right choices. Give me the wisdom I need. And then give me the grace and the strength to apply that wisdom to act on it. I wonder if maybe some of you in here today, as we've been considering Solomon's story and the need of wisdom, that there's been a particular, maybe a particular situation in your life that the Lord has brought to your mind and you've been thinking about, that you need specific wisdom for this situation. Is that you today? If so, I'd like to pray with you about that. 
Would you just slip up your hand and say, yes, I have a situation. Thank you so much. All over the room, so many people. Yes, thank you. On my right over here, center and left, everywhere. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much. For those that raised your hand, I'm going to lead us in a, in a prayer here in a moment. I'm going to ask God on your behalf, and I want you to again ask God specifically for your situation that God would give you the wisdom that you need. Our Heavenly Father, there are a number of people in here who have acknowledged just a moment ago by raising their hand that they need wisdom for a specific situation in their life. And Lord, I pray for them that you would give them that wisdom. Even as Paul prayed for the Colossian believers, that they would be filled with the knowledge of your will. Lord, open the doors that need to be opened. Close the doors that need to be closed. Supernaturally arrange the circumstances and guide them into your will. Bring to their mind the commands and principles of Scripture that have bearing on this situation. Put the people in their life that they need to point them in the right direction and give them godly counsel. Lord, lead them by your Holy Spirit, I pray. So that as they come through this situation, they can look back and see how you guided them and they can say, praise the Lord. He gave me wisdom when I needed it. Lord, would you do that for them? Lord, I am so thankful for how you've guided me guided my family through so many times of decision. You've always been there for us. And Lord, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory that is due you. God, I pray now that you would bless as we dismiss. We look forward to when we can be in your house again tonight as we partake of the Lord's Supper together this evening. I pray even now that it would be a sweet time of remembering the sacrifice of our Savior. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.